53, and uh, we'll get started with our message, and I hope and pray we'll get done with it, but we'll do all that we can in the time allotted. But praise the Lord, you're here. Thank you for coming. There are some that, uh, of course, have been hindered from coming, and we'll pray for them. But let me just get started real quick. Last Sunday, our message was on propitiation, and our hearts now have to turn from what we have learned over the year, we started out with a lot of emphasis on Christmas and the birth of Christ. And I always love Christmas, don't you? How many of you love Christmas and the birth of Christ? Wonderful time and enjoyed every minute of it. And then we turned our hearts from Christmas to the love of God. On February the 14th, we celebrated not Valentine's, but God's Love Day. And I thank the Lord for the good day that we had and the luncheon that we had after the service and all the emphasis that we had on serving the Lord and that he loves us and that we love him. Aren't you glad we have a God of love? Amen. For God is love, the Bible says, and so on. And then we now turn our thoughts to the Passover, or some people call it Easter, to the Passover celebrated by the Jews beginning on the evening of April the 14th and commencing um, with the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 21st. So there's going to be, for the Jewish people, going to be a big celebration here uh, very soon in April. But now we are thinking about, not the Jewish Passover, but we're thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Aren't you glad he arose? Amen. I love the song, He Arose. Up from the grave, He Arose. So then that means that we are looking forward to, and this is something we don't do much, but we're looking forward to the cross. That's what we've been singing about this morning. You say, but preacher, the cross is already passed. I know that. And we always say we're looking back to the ones in the Old Testament look forward. But in our time here, church time, we're kind of looking forward to the cross, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's our thought process. For those of you who were not here last Sunday, we are going to review the subject of propitiation. And uh, we're going to move from propitiation to atonement because I talked about atonement a little bit. But uh, propitiation has the meaning of satisfaction and I emphasize that word and meaning over and over again on purpose. And the reason that I emphasize it over and over again on purpose was because most people say propitiation means appeasement. And I want you to get away from that thought. And appeasement means it, it has in the meaning of it to appease an angry God. And I got news for you folks. You can't reconcile First John's passage where it says God is love with propitiating or appeasing an angry God. You, those two don't really, you say, well, God does have anger. God does have wrath. We understand that. But it does not say in the Bible God is anger. It doesn't say in the Bible God is wrath. Now, he has wrath. He has anger. Those are emo God has emotions like you and I have. We are made in the image of God and he has emotions. But God's nature is love. Can I hear an amen? His nature is love. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't have wrath. But to say propitiation means to appease an angry God, that just doesn't work in God's plan here. Now, I'm sure that a lot of sinners would be turned off if they thought that God didn't love them, that he was angry with. You say, well, the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. Well, I'll tell you something. I'd never go to a sinner and say, God is angry with you. Why don't you get saved? How many of you think that gets a sinner saved? I, I guarantee you people that win souls to Christ say, Do you know God loves you? Is that right? And here's a person that's been down the road of life and sin, and you say to him, well, God is angry with you. Well, you don't start there. You start with God is love. So I want you to get away from, I want everybody, I don't care who they are, to think about this word propitiation meaning satisfy the nature of God. Everything that God is was a pro Jesus Christ propitiated it or satisfied it when he died on the cross of Calvary and he rose again. Jesus is the satisfaction. First and foremost, he is not first and foremost an appeasement. Now you think about that. Now if you reverse that order, 
Satisfaction and appeasement is the order. Satisfaction and appeasement. But if you reverse it and say appeasement, satisfaction, you've made God an angry God. And I think God is love and not an angry God. But there is wrath and there is anger. Now, I want to destroy in our minds the idea of appeasement and change it to satisfaction and make sure we understand that. And I'm going to show you more about that this morning. Let me give this one verse and ask you to find God's anger in it. I want you to see this is Isaiah 53 10. I want you to see if you can find God's anger in this verse. Isaiah 53 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offer for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In that verse, there are four words that begin with the letter P. You will notice them. Pleased, prolong, pleasure, and prosper. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to take each one of those words and examine those four words that start with the letter P in Isaiah 53, 10. And I want you to find anger in any one of those. There is no anger in any of those verses. But in verse 11, Isaiah 53, 11, if you drop down one verse, we find the real meaning of propitiation. Isaiah 53, 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be, help me out now, what is it? Satisfied. There's your meaning for propitiation, satisfied. It didn't say God's anger was appeased, did it? It didn't say that. It said he shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now, actually, that is talking about the Lord Jesus seeing the travail of his own soul. But Jesus is satisfied. So is God. Is that right? Amen. So it is. By, their knowledge, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. In that phrase, shall be satisfied, we see the meaning of propitiation. It does not say shall be appeased. God the Father saw what was happening to the soul of his only begotten son. Did God love his only begotten son? He did. Was he satisfied with him? Was he satisfied with his sacrifice? Yes. Was he satisfied with his giving himself for the sins and bearing the iniquity of all? Is he sat yes, he was satisfied with all that. A loving father of a loving son does not need appeasing, but he does need satisfaction. Oh my goodness, there's so much to say about that. He looks at his son and is satisfied, yet it pleased the Lord. We'll find in another place, pleased the Lord, yet it pleased the Lord, verse 10. Pleased him, satisfied. In verse 10, we see that God made the son's soul an offering for sin. God made the son's soul an offering for sin. In verse 11, we see that Jesus saw the travail of his own soul. In verse 12, we see that Jesus poured out his soul unto death. In verse 10, 12, we see that Jesus poured out his own soul to death. In verse 10, we see the offering of the soul for sin. That offering of his soul for sin is pleasing to God. And do you know what? That offering of his soul caused that to prosper in his hand. Do you know what prosper means? That means that there are going to be, the pouring out of his soul was prosperous. That means there are going to be more souls. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those souls that he saw. That was the prospering in his hand. Aren't you one of those souls that Jesus saw, it was, he gave his soul an offering for sin and it prospered in his hand. He saw other souls. So we see a picture beginning here. So there's an intense labor in verse 11, the travail of Christ. I'm not preaching on the crucifixion so as, as such right now. And I could go through all the different agonies of Christ on the cross and you know those well. Not a one of us would have liked to have been put on the cross and suffered what he suffered, the beatings, etc., the nails, etc. We wouldn't want that. We wouldn't probably make it through it. But I'm glad he made it through it, aren't you? Aren't you glad Jesus made it through all the suffering? 
He did. But we, what Christ saw, this is Isaiah 53, this year, year before that ever happened, Christ saw the travail of his soul. Think about that. People say in eternity past, but that's not correct. If, if it's eternity, it doesn't have a past, present, and a future. Eternity is eternity. It doesn't have a tense. It doesn't have past, present, and future. So people that say eternity past, eternity present, eternity future, that's ridiculous. You can't put time in eternity. It has no time. But in eternity, the Lord Jesus saw the travail of his soul. And he was satisfied. But I want you to think about see the travail. Can't, this is something. You and I know that when a person is born, and I don't know when the soul enters the body, and I don't think anybody does, but when a soul enters that newborn, and that newborn is brought forth, that mother has been through tremendous travail. Is that right, ladies? Yes. Amen. But when that child is put on her breast, and that face is looking at her face. Is she satisfied? Yes, Man, what a picture. He sees the travail of his soul and he's satisfied. Because not only does he see the souls, of his, the travail of his own soul, but he sees the many souls that are going to come from that. So we have then a picture like the birth of a baby. But we see Christ seeing not only the birth of one, we see Christ seeing because of the travail of his soul, the birth of many. Think about this a minute. Do you think that Jesus Christ could see all that were going to be saved because of his death on the cross? Now you think about that just a minute. He, he sees the travail of his soul and he's satisfied. In other words, all the souls from day one to the very end of time, he sees a multitude and multitude and multitude. Do you think he was pleased with that? How many of you think the Lord was pleased when he saw the travail of my soul brought for all of these? Amen? Can you imagine that? You say, preacher, it's a little bit more than I can imagine. Well, the book writer of Hebrews says something like this. He said in Hebrews 12, 1, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Somehow or another, the writer of the Hebrews is seeing a little bit into the heavenlies. And he sees this great cloud of witnesses. But imagine the Lord Jesus Christ seeing all the souls that would come to him because of the travail of his own soul. That brings us to this great process now that's taking place, the pleasure of God that pleased the Lord, and it was a pleasure to him. We see in verse 5 of Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was bruised, bruised for our iniquities. The word bruised comes from a word meaning to collapse physically and emotionally. I don't know too many people that have had a nervous break but down, but I understand it's a terrible thing. Um, I think I saw my mother go through something similar to it. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't nice. It was an agony. I'm not sure if that's what it was or not. But I do know one thing, that when it says bruised, it has the idea of a collapse physically and a collapse emotionally. When I think of this word bruise, I automatically go, and of course I can't help it. If you read the Bible like I'm supposed to read it, and like you're supposed to read it, when one word comes up, you will think of another word. How many of you do that? I'll go to this passage, and all of a sudden that word comes popping back up, and I think of the first place I read bruise. And here's what it says in Genesis 3.15. It's called the proto evangelium proto evangelium what does that mean the first gospel the first evangelistic word here it is in genesis 3:15 and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head the 
It's talking about Satan. And thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. God is speaking to Satan in the form of a serpent. I'm not sure how all that came to be. I don't know why Satan didn't choose another creature, but that's just the one that he was in. And we don't know the original form of it. Some say that the original animals, this serpent might have had legs, and this serpent could have been the most beautiful creature of the garden. I don't know about all that. You know why I don't know? Because the Bible doesn't tell me. I don't know if the creature had legs. You say, well, they say that the serpents have little places where it looks like they had legs. And then they say that evolution took place and God used evolution. I don't believe a minute of that. Do you? Not a bit of it. And so here's this beautiful creature, a serpent. Whether it was the most beautiful in the garden, I don't know why Satan chose it. Why God let him go into that creature, I don't know. I don't know if I'll even care when I get to heaven. I don't think it makes any difference. That rascal is going to be thrown into the lake of fire and I'm not going to give a rip about him. I'll be so full of the glory of God, I won't care. So God is speaking to Satan in the form of a serpent. And the serpent, of course, Satan has spoken to Eve through uh, this created being, the serpent, and deceived her, as you know. And so now God speaks to the serpent or Satan and he places on the serpent. I'm, I'm amazed at this. I don't know why. Uh, he would curse the serpent because I don't think the serpent had a whole lot to do with this. But somehow or another, the serpent gets cursed because he was used by Satan. And you know the story. He has to crawl on his belly the rest of his life. Now, I don't think it was the serpent's fault, but I do know this one thing for sure. Every time you see a snake, about every one of us will run. Is that right? Is that the truth? I don't care what it is. You say, well, they won't hurt you. That little green snake won't hurt you. That little black snake won't hurt you. I still run. And I still want to take a hoe or a shovel and kill it. I mean, every time. I don't know why. It's an instinct. How many of you are afraid of snakes? It's a natural thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, I was working with a crew one time. We did landscaping and septic tanks. And an old fella pop of the boss man he left a great big black snake an artificial one in the seat of the tractor and every morning I came in and I was to service all the equipment and so I come in and I'm going to start the tractor up I'm going to make sure it's got fuel make sure it's got the grease fittings and all that stuff and the black snake was sitting in that seat and I didn't know it and I popped up on top of there like a you know, like a jaybird, you know, I'm ready to go to work. And boy, I started to sit down, that black snake sitting there. I jumped slap up in the air like a cat. You ever seen a cat jump straight up in the air? I jumped straight up in the air like a cat. And the boss man, daddy, was sitting over at the screen door watching me. He about fell out in the yard laughing. I never will get over that. I, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare him real good. <laughs> but you know, there's a hostility between Satan and mankind now. There's a, there was a hostility between us and serpents because of that curse. But there's a hostility between the believer and Satan. But there's not only a hostility between the believer and Satan. There's a hostility. Satan hates mankind. He does. You know why? Because they bear the image of God. He hates them. And can I tell you something else? He sure does hate a believer. There's a natural or supernatural hostility. So the enmity or hatred or hostility remains between us today but the seed of the serpent is a portion of the human family that continues to be his moral offspring and follows the first transgression without repentance or refuge in the mercy of God the seed of the woman on the other hand must denote the remnant who are born from above and hence turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God the seed of the woman which speaks of Christ will bruise the head of the serpent amen I'm glad the seed of the woman bruises the head of the serpent. And then Satan is going to bruise his heel. Now on the cross, Christ was placed on that cross. And you know that some people say they did this or did that. You know, we don't know all about those things. But we know that he had nail wounds in his feet, don't we? We know that. We don't know exactly where they were. But anyway, they put his heels together for sure in order to put nail, a one nail through both feet. 
And I don't know about you, but just somebody mashing things together, I, it makes it awful uncomfortable, especially if it's like healed. But anyway, they put a nail in his feet, or one nail in his feet, I believe. And that was the bruising of his heel by Satan. But that wasn't nothing compared to what Christ did to Satan. Christ is going to bruise Satan's head. That means to crush. That means to collapse. Aren't you glad Christ defeated our natural or supernatural enemy? Amen. Are you glad Satan's a defeated foe? I mean, are you glad when a snake is dead and not crawling around? Huh? Are you glad about that? i tell you another snake story right quick. I should, it is not in the message, but I'll give you another one. I found a, a watermark, no, a cotton, what do you call that brown one? Uh, copperhead, copperhead. I found this uh, copperhead in the, in the road, and he was about as thick as my arm and about that long. They don't get very long. So I was in my Volkswagen, and I ran over it with my Volkswagen, and it didn't kill it. Volkswagen too light. So I ran back over it again. It still didn't kill it. And I ran back over it again. It still didn't get it. It's in the middle of the night. I took a boy home who was working in the bus garage, working on buses. And I took that Volkswagen and I skidded over it. You know what I mean by skid? Hit the brakes and slid over it. I finally got him. Then I got out and I said, ah, I got me a dead snake and the preacher's up under the bus. I'm going to scare the preacher. Things do come back to haunt you, don't they? And so I took that dead copperhead, I thought, and I put him in the back of my Volkswagen under my seat. My seats, you know, how many of you know a little Volkswagen about this? Little old bitty Volkswagen back behind the seats about that much, and I put him down there. And I had about 15, 20 miles to go before I got back to the bus garage. And as I was going down through there, that snake was going, I said, Good grief. I stopped and get out, and I looked back at her and said, Are you sure that thing's dead? And I was sitting on the edge of my seat. For 15 miles thinking that snake's going to crawl up under the back of that seat and bite my knee, knee or leg or something. I finally got him to the bus ride. And I was, I was a nervous wreck, folks, because that thing, I've been buzzing behind me all this time. And so I got back over there to the bus ride. And I said, I'm going to scare the preacher. Good. He's up under there changing something in the transmission. I don't know. We had so much trouble you wouldn't believe it. But anyway, I took that old big copperhead and I just slung him up under the bus. Preacher, he's an old country boy. He looked at me and said, where'd you get that? <laughs> it then bothered him a bit. And I'm sitting there just like this. <laughs> yeah, I've been driving 15 miles about scaring me dead. You know what? I'm glad Satan's dead, so to speak. Amen? Did you, are you still scared? I'm, I, listen, I am scared of Satan, that's for sure. But I'll tell you one thing. Christ bruised his head on Calvary. How many of you believe that? He did. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Now, here's what I know about the devil. <clears throat> I'm glad that the Lord bruised his head, for sure. But the Bible tells me something about him. The Bible says this, resist the devil. Does it say that? How many of you know your Bible says resist the devil? And he will what? Flee. He will flee from you. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but most snakes are running from you most of the time, believe it or not. They don't like you near as much as you think they like to bite you, but they like to get out of the way. But anyway, so he flees if you resist him. But you say, well, how do I resist the devil? Would you like to know how to resist the devil? Anybody? How many of you want the devil on the run? One, two, three, four. Okay, we're getting, I want the devil getting out of here, don't you? All right, here's what it says. In the first of James 4, 7, here's what it says. This is how to get the devil on the run. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Amen. You see, if you really want the devil on the run, you've got to submit to God. You say, what does that mean? I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to understand that we ought to have a submissive attitude to whatever God's word says. If God's word said it, let's do it. Can I hear an amen? amen? Amen. That's what we ought to do. So submit to God. Now we've got to turn back to atonement. I said we're going to talk about atonement, so we've got to turn back to that thought for a minute. 
Have you ever heard of the Jewish holiday Yom Kippur or Yom Kippur? Well, some people have, okay. It is the holiest day of the Jewish year. The year, according to our calendar, this year, according to our calendar, the Day of Atonement will begin on Friday, October the 17th, 11th, I'm sorry, October the 11th, and end Saturday, October the 12th. Now, that's an amazing thought because uh, the Day of Atonement is in October, and we're going to talk about some other things. It is called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. The holiday is observed with a 25-hour fast. How many of you need to do that besides me? I know I need to. 25-hour fast and special religious service. Historical origins. According to tradition, the first Yom Kippur took place after the Israelites exodus from Egypt and their arrival at Mount Sinai. Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. When Moses descended the mountain, he found the Israelites worship a golden calf in anger. God, uh, he shattered the sacred tables. Atonement was made for their, their idolatry. We won't go into all the story. And God forgave their sins, offering Moses a second set of tables. That was where we think it began, believe it or not. So we find that atonement process where they had worshipped that golden calf and all that went with it, all the sin and wickedness that went with it. And uh, then God says, okay, Moses, you do this, and that, uh, sin was atoned for. During biblical times, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, was the only day when the high priest could enter the inner sanctum or the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle of, or later the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. The high priest performed rituals and sprinkled blood from sacrificed animals on the ark. And I'm just giving a summary because I don't want to go into all of it. I'll go into more of it tonight. Uh, atonement was made on behalf of all the people of Israel for one year. The word atonement meant then a covering for the sins of the people for one year. Just a covering. This covering that we find that is used on this Yom Kippur, this covering harks back to the original sin and God's provision for Adam and Eve. And so here we find another word, this covering of the sins from the Day of Atonement process in the tabernacle, the putting off or the covering of their sins for a year we have this idea of covering, and it goes back to Genesis again. Isn't that amazing? Everything starts in Genesis. You know, you can find all the major doctrines of the Bible in the book of Genesis. You just go back. You'll find them. And so here it is. It goes back to uh, Genesis, and it also goes back to our uh, Genesis 3.15. also goes back to Isaiah 53, and look at this verse 7. Verse 7 in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. The day of atonement began at the first occurrence of sin in Genesis when God made Adam and Eve coats of the skins of animals. Do you know something? I'm going to tell you something right quick. Genesis 3.21 says, Unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. You say, preacher, I've heard many preachers preach that there was a sacrifice of an animal. There was. There had to be an animal killed. No doubt about it. If you got skins of an animal, you got it, a sacrifice or at least the death of an animal. Can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit didn't start with the death of an animal in that verse. The Holy Spirit said that God made them a covering from the skins. You say, well, what's the, what are you talking about? The importance in Genesis 3.21 is not the death of the animal. The importance of Genesis 3.21 is the covering. The covering. You see, the God said, I've got to cover them. Why did he have to cover them? Because of their nakedness. They felt bad. They had guilt. They had shame because of their nakedness. So for the first time, sin has created guilt. And God said, I got to take care of it. And so he did kill an animal. 
Uh, I mean, it's obvious that he had to, but that's not the important thing right now. You see, later on, the idea of the sacrificial animal is going to come, I think, with Abel. You say, what was the Holy Spirit doing? Why didn't he cover the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice over in this part? And then over later on, he brings it up again. Now, I'll tell you what, the covering was important before we bring up the sacrifice. The sacrifice is important too. But the Holy Spirit says, I want to tell you about, I've got a covering for man's guilt. Man has sinned and I'm going to make a covering for that guilt. Can I tell you something right quick? Every single one of us, God says, when you sin, you do feel guilt. Is that true? Is that a fact? And God says, I want you to know something. I've got a provision for your guilt. I will make you a coat. Of course, there's the, the skins that came from the animals, but that's not important right now. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to think about that right now. We're going to find, think about that later. By the way, the Holy Spirit's not going to leave anything out, but he wants you to think of things in a certain order. So we think of the covering of our guilt. That's what we're to think of. Do you know what? I, I've heard preachers really elaborate on the sacrificial animal right here, the first one that was sacrificed. Now, wait just a minute. I'm not against that, but can I tell you something? Don't get ahead of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says the important thing is the covering of your guilt. I'll tell you how that happens later. But right now, I want you to know I've got a covering for your guilt. Do you know what? Man has tried to cover his guilt in a thousand ways. You, people go through all kinds of religious observances to cover their guilt. People do all kinds of work-related things. They do all kinds of things to allay their guilt or somehow to cover their guilt. Can I tell you something? God is saying, I made you a covering. Man didn't make you a covering. The animals are not making you a covering. I made you a covering. You say, but hey, animals did. No, we're not to worship animals like the Egyptians. What happened there at Sinai when they put up a golden calf and worshiping the animal? He said, no, no, it's not the animal that I killed. That's not, the, that's not the thing. The covering I made. You said, well, God, the first seamstress. Jesus was a great bruiser. He bruised the head of the serpent. And God was a seamstress. He made him a coat. You know what coat means? It means to hang from the shoulders. It means to cover all the way to the ground. Can I tell you something? God says, I'm going to make a covering for your guilt that is complete and it will do all that it's supposed to do. It will cover every bit of your guilt. All of it. So man has all these other things they try. You say, how do you know that? Adam and Eve, guilty. What did they do? Big leaves, big leaves, big leaves. Did that work? Do you know something? If I thought that my fig leaves were good enough, I would have stood out in the midst of the garden and said, Hello, God. Did they stand out in the garden and say, Hello, God, here I am. Did they do that? What did they do? They hid. Well, why just meant preacher? They had their nakedness covered with fig leaves. We don't know how many it was. Some people say they were many skirts and all that stuff. I don't know what that stuff is. Can I tell you something? Fig leaves didn't cover their guilt. They were insufficient. By the way, how many of you ever seen a fig leaf? It's going to be kind of hard to put them things. You know, they got this big loop and this big loop. It's going to be hard to put them things together to cover, cover the neck. Fig leaves wouldn't work. But God's skins worked. Why? Because God made a covering for the guilt of mankind. And I can be satisfied right now when I go to Isaiah 53, when I go to the cross of Jesus Christ. How many of you remember the word expiate last week? Expiate, do you remember that word? Okay, here is where expiation comes in. Expiation satisfies or releases the guilt. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad your guilt can be gone? You know we sing the song, gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Don't we? Do we sing it? Do we mean it? What about if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of you like that verse? 
Can I tell you something? Listen to this. All unrighteousness at the bottom of 1 John 1. Is that 7? Is that verse 7? How many of you know? Is it 7 or 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 7? 9? Okay, 9. Okay. Can I tell you something? All unrighteousness includes guilt. All unrighteousness. Guilt is unrighteous. I don't know about you folks, but there's a thousand times I have felt guilty. And just as many times as I have felt guilty, I have done exactly what 1 John 1, 9 says. Confess my sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us. Our, you know why? Because God made a complete covering. Or guilt. Amen? Amen. Let's bow for prayer.